All right. Pop culture, pop urbanism, or interesting popular expressions. And again, three authors, which we'll go, we're going to cover very quickly. Jane Jacobs first. And it's interesting to actually pay attention only into the first, the, the beginnings of these books, the, the starts, the first sentences of the books. And I think I have a couple of examples, Jane Jacobs and, and also Robert Venturi and Dennis Scott Brown. So Jane Jacobs starts her book by writing, this book is an attack on current city planning and rebuilding. So it's very straightforward, right? No messing around. This is what this book is about. And to contextualize, um, this book was written in a context of redevelopment of New York where Robert Moses, which was the, the general planner in the city, was uh, trying to uh, transform the city through um, infrastructural operations and cutting the city fabric uh, by new highways and kind of very uh, uh, it very much in line with the infrastructural modernistic planning approach, we could say. And then Jane Jacobs completely rejected that type of planning and advocated for a small scale community based, diversity based, uh, life street, commercial street kind of urbanism that would kept the, uh, the old fabrics of, uh, you know, Williamsburg or the, the, the old city fabrics uh, of the city. Most importantly than critiquing, uh, she attempted to introduce principles of city planning and rebuilding different from schools of architecture and planning to the Sunday supplements and women's magazines. So there was also this ambition of uh, making uh, the general population aware of these debates and of these critiques in order to engage them in activist protest and to raise their voices against the municipality, the municipal plans for demolishing and, and transforming the city into a kind of more functional, modernistic uh, type of one. And basically, she uh, formulates a, a series of both critiques and proposals and uh, uh, remarkable ones or Inf uh, influential ones have been, for instance, the, the, the values found in the proximity uh, type of street uh, in what she called Ison Street. So the social control of the street by the neighbors, by the inhabitants through their uh, windows, having this close relation between house and, and the street or the value of the sidewalk as a space of encounter, as a space of interaction, of social uh, exchange, the importance of commerce and commercial activities and trade in the ground floors, uh, you know, to provide, you know, urban life and so on, and in order to create community at the end. Runner Banham, on the other hand, um, also architectural historian, from England moving to the United States to study Los Angeles. Uh, and this couple of common books, Los Angeles uh, by Rainer Banham and Las Vegas by uh, Robert Venturi and Dennis Scott Brown were uh, quite um, groundbreaking or provocative because they were, they were putting in the in the in the architectural debate or in the urban debate types of cities which were considered to be, you know, non-planned whatsoever, according to the classical tradition or the modern tradition of, of uh, European urban planning or architecture, right? They were considered to be non-exemplary cases, nothing to learn from. And this both, uh, this group of architects actually traveled to, to these cities to actually uh, learn from, um, from 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 reality from from what's out there uh, from society um, the ordinary becomes a, a very important term for them right so the, the giving value to the order, ordinary things and, and ordinary architecture is not really aimed at being pieces of art or so on so Rainer Banham defines 
the city according to four ecologies, what he calls four ecologies, which already is kind of quite innovative way of looking at, at the city or urban spaces uh, of distinct ecologies or um, surf, surf urbia, foothill, plains of it, and autopia. We don't have time to go through all of them, um, but we will uh, just basically um, stay for a, for a minute in, in the autopia as a type of city that Ronnie Urbanum sees as, um, as liberating, uh, as very hedonistic, as providing the urban citizens with full freedom and emancipation to actually experience uh, the city in a new way, contemporary way. And for him, Autopia comes from auto, so the, it's the city of the car, is the city of the highway, where these large infrastructures allow movement and speed uh, and provide autonomy to the individual to actually move freely and to move from one ecology to the other and to experience the city in a complete different way. Uh, than the old, you know, kind of stiff uh, uh, um, European dense city centers, right? Uh, and again, uh, he's interested in a kind of diversity, uh, but very different, let's say, from from what we've seen from Ungers and Rowe, which had always a pretentious uh, a pretension of good architecture, quality architecture, you know, through the, through, through the work of composition and so on. He identifies these values of difference in the different ecologies. For instance, Los Angeles becoming a, pro, uh, a city informed by, with little uh, uh, jewels or marvels like this uh, cantilevering uh, terrace or house almost in suspension, overlooking into the vast artificial landscape of the metropolis with almost no end, right? But it reinforces a lot the individual subject experiencing the city in a kind of detachment and also putting, bringing value to these popular expressions of, you know, signs and, and banners and colorful kind of advertisements uh, as elements that define the, the urban landscape. So Autopia or the Autopia is uh, constituted by this extremely large, long and wide highways with Banham, which Banham regards as, as marbles almost of uh, engineering, structural engineering and spatial kind of uh, uh, spatial artifacts that not only because of the speed that they allow in, in moving within the city, but also as, as pieces, as objects of architecture themselves, right? In, in these beautiful forms and shapes that they create. In this way, Banham was probably anticipating or very right in, in pointing at the elements that um, preserve or that remain uh, in the contemporary city through the expansion of the last decades of continuous urbanization, right? And if we look at Los Angeles today or some of these mega, mega cities or, or, or large metropolis, these are probably the elements that are uh, essentially structuring uh, all of the spatial relations in the city. Whether we look at them as as beautiful objects or not, probably we have changed our minds there. But definitely these are elements that have become uh, substantial part and uh, determining parts or elements of our contemporary urban conditions, the space of logistics, the infrastructural space, the space of mobility uh, have become uh, really crucial urban elements. On the other hand, Venturi and Scott Brown traveled to Las Vegas, what was supposed to be, you know, the, the, probably the best expression of low popular culture without any ambition of, of, uh, uh, of being, of any ambition of architecture with capital A, right? An arch architecture which is not really designed, which is not based on the history of architecture, which is not based on the classical uh, um, understandings of 
what architecture is, but that on the other hand, according to them, have has created an unparalleled, unique um, urban situation or urban condition, right? being the expression, the genuine, pure expression of contemporary society. Um, in this way, very much in connection with pop art, right? So <clears throat> the use of ordinary banal elements as distinctive elements that represent certain societal um, historical moment or, or period and, and finding the beauty in the most, let's say, an ambitious kind of piece of industrial production, for instance. So uh, they capture and they engage in this again mapping of the city. Uh, maybe some of these projects also um, uh, can be seen as a response to, to a, a question we had last session in with regards to Serdas non um, Serdas inability or or of acknowledging the existing landscape, let's say, or, or the imposition of a mathematical order or a statistical order into a into a territory without accounting for the existing traces, right? So in this sense, uh, uh, these authors here engage in mapping the city through the recognition of their elements before coming with a new plan or coming with a new design, right? So it's learning from what's surrounding us before prior to coming up with a, with a solution. Um, so advertising, um, signs, symbols, banners as um, architectural elements. Interestingly enough, if you know a little bit the, the trajectory that Robert Venturi followed, he actually was in Rome and his previous book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, actually anal analyzes um, a classic or, uh, uh, architecture of, of Rome and the Renaissance and so on. So when going to Las Vegas to analyze it, he makes a connection or they both make a connection, Venturi Scott Brown, with the Noli map of Rome which is this famous map uh, of Rome um, that uh, draws not only the, the, the solid void that we have seen in, in Colin Rose maps, uh, so not only the private public space, not only the built versus the unbuilt space, but draws all of the accessible spaces. So all of the spaces that are to some extent made public, even though they are not public in, in terms of, uh, of ownership, but are public in the sense that they are accessible. So they are part of the experience of the city by a pedestrian, right? Are part of the promenade. And these include um, uh, religious buildings or, or civic uh, public buildings or uh, other kinds of uh, uh, elements that really play a role in the experience of the daily life in the city. We see the Pantheon on the center, right? So this uh, kind of very rigorous and inspirational drawing is, is, is picked is by uh, Bentry Scott Brown as a reference to map and learn from Las Vegas, right? Can we look at Las Vegas with this level of detail and with these spatial lenses where, where we basically look at the accessible spaces, at the experience in the city? regardless of the private and public distinction, can we map uh, the spaces that we can access? And in, in, in this way, they really recreate the Noli map. They even provide this kind of uh, also uh, a provocation of uh, juxtaposing or superimposing a, a sign of Las Vegas, Nevada on top of the Noli map. And then they, they explain it uh, in this way. Nolly's map of the mid 18th century reveals the sensitive and complex connections between public and private space in Rome. Private buildings are shown in gray, cross hatching this that is carved into by the public space, exterior and interior. So, in this way, some interior spaces are considered to be uh, uh, exterior spaces in the way that they are fully uh, accessible, right? These spaces, open or roofed, are shown in minute detail through darker poche. 
for shaping these carved spaces in a solid, right? Interiors of churches read like piazzas and courtyards of palaces, yet a variety of quality and scales is articulated. In this sense, they try to, uh, to carry on, to carry out the same type of mapping uh, in Las Vegas. Also find, uh, finding uh, representations or symbolic expressions that always go back to this, you know, to this original Rome, right? As the source of everything coming from, from Rome or, or this uh, kind of flat image uh, of the reference. They, they, they use the flattening of the memory to just one sign. So they basically also um, uh, um, formulate or talk about the sign and the symbol as an architectural element, uh, as you may have realized, completely different strand here uh, than some of the previous authors, or definitely than modernistic principles, right? So here they engage with experience, with perceptions, with memory, uh, with the with the everyday kind of uh, uh, kind of banal landscape, and they look at architecture in their communicative aspects aspect. Uh, architecture as a device for communication, right? What symbol, what, what signs are telling us how architecture is able to communicate something. Um, and they essentially uh, focus in what they call the strip of Las Vegas, which is this axis along which uh, you can find all of the uh, casinos and lobbies and hotels and so on. Casinos and lobbies of Las Vegas are ornamental and monumental and open to the promenading, promenading public, making the connection with the Noli map of Rome, right? They are equally monumental, they are equally ornamental, they equally carry meaning, give meaning to the city, and they are equally open to the public in their prominence. Series of maps, um, um, in order to understand the logics of these developments from more classical buildings or solid void to, to surface and material mappings of the asphalt, for instance, the, the straight spaces for parking, uh, and how all of these symbolic signs are uh, largely located along this axis, defining a front facade and a, and a back, uh, more kind of functional, um, space and eventually ending with a Noli map, which is the one you see on the top right corner, uh, the Noli map of the stripe of Las Vegas, as they put it. Yeah, I think we can skip that because we might run out of time. And then the third part, uh, and just to wrap up with this quick journey of postmodernism strength. The neo historicism or neo traditionalism, um, which emerged also in a, in a, in this uh, postmodern period, and I would basically use a uh, uh, most influential uh, figure of this movement, which is Leon Creer, a book I did not present earlier. Um, Creer is perhaps the most belligerent, kind of aggressive uh, critic of the modernistic uh, paradigm, of the modernistic urbanism. And he's in fact a very talented also uh, um, drawer or illustrator. So he's been producing this series of uh, sketches that uh, almost in a um, ironic or, 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 or cynical way, uh, criticize the the aspects or the main uh, properties of modernistic urbanism and compare it with the actual good proper city, which is what he advocates for and that he knows, right? Um, so in this sense, the city would be this uh, uh, kind of uh, assemblage of of different forms uh, and, and mixed uses with housing, dwelling, working, public culture and on, whereas modernist zoning implies the separation of these urban functions. You live in one side uh, in a kind of repetitive uh, 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 patrol residential area, 
and then you go to church or you go to buy into, into another space. Uh, so if the pre-industrial um, city is composed of several communities, as he calls it, and, and they were intertwined and the different aspects of life were uh, in contact one to each other, right? The, all of these elements we've been looking at the economic aspect of life, the family aspect of life, the, the religious or the symbolic or the public, they were spheres that were in, in, uh, intertwined in a way or, or, or one next to each other. Whereas the, the modernistic paradigm has separated uh, uh, these spheres into different elements also spatially. Right by pushing work on the one sphere, uh, uh, politics on the other sphere, uh, trade in another sphere, living in another sphere, and so on. Uh, so extremely critical of functional segregation, as you would, of course, is a bit of a, he uses this kind of ironic tone as a kind of a joke, but as you would take a body, a human body, and separate the different parts, like you know, different organs separated from each other. And eventually he uh, also ends up proposing a kind of very largely classical or neoclassical kind of uh, reading of the city, going back again to, to, you know, to Greek towns or to Roman towns with this understanding of the city as formed by, by the addition of two realms, the realm of the public and the realm of the private, right? The res economica, where would be the, the, the streets, the squares, and, and the living and the working and so on, commerce, where, and the other layer, which would be the res publica, which would be all of the monuments and in relation to squares and representative symbolic uh, architecture and so on. And the two layers really form the urbanity, which we should bring back, according to Leon Creer, right? And he even um, engages in a, in a, he's also critical of a grid, uh, advocates for a small scale from this kind of angle perspective, uh, from the, the, the twisting of the models um, and uh, provides solutions of the good city or the proper city, also in terms of uh, harmonic uh, relations between uh, or proportions between built and unbuilt, public and private, and so on. I mean, something which you might really regard as, 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 as um, outdated in the sense that doesn't really um, account for the full complexity of the contemporary cities today. But, uh, so, and just to finish, I would like to, uh, to show this project that would link us back to the beginning of our lecture, uh, last week or last Monday in Barcelona is a is a studio project that he made in the for the city of Barcelona, where he proposed to rethink the urban block, this um, uh, interway 130 meters separated interway system that Serda uh, uh, created, and his proposal was to break down again this unity of the block into several small architectural objects. So we see again, this shrinking uh, of, the, of the scale of urban design, the, the focus on the fragment, the architectural object, you know, all of these elements which are common to these authors. We've been looking at the proximity of the street and the house and the small life and, and you know, the, the, the making public, the opening up of the internal space of the block of the yard in order to create these passages or alleyways and so on. And all in all, kind of a, a recreation of a, almost of a harmonic small village, you could, you could talk in that way. Um, and, but basically by subdividing uh, in a four by four grid, the existing grid of Serda, right? Um, this project um, motivated a critique or a letter written in response to this project by Manuel de Sola Morales, which was, uh, which was friend of Leon Creer, uh, but on the other hand, uh, was completely opposed to this project. And then he wrote uh, an article called Why 22, Why 22, Dear Leon, 
uh, which was the measure, the size of the um, of the buildings that proposed were proposed by Creer in his proposal. And then uh, he continued to argue. And Manuel de Morales was an architect and urban designer from Barcelona, extremely influential, the 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 founder um, disciple of CERT also we've seen before and also the, the founder of the Laboratory of Urbanism of Barcelona. Uh, so extremely influential figure in the urbanism of Barcelona in, in recent, recent decades. So in this article, he writes, or he explains why he had missed the point, how Leon Creer had missed, has missed the point, because the unit or the module uh, of the Barcelona's plan or grid is not the urban block, it's not the square but it's actually the crossroads, is actually the intersection. Uh, as we have seen in the very beginning of our sessions, this foundational moment of encounter between the two axes as the foundational origin of the urban system, right? And the emphasis put on the infrastructural space, on the public space rather than in the built space uh, that uh, Serda put so many emphasis in. As we might remember, all of his studies of circulation, radius, uh, visuals, uh, and also the uh, materialities of the public spaces, of the pavements and of the surfaces, uh, were essential to defining the urban model by, by Serda. Uh, extreme uh, care was put by Serda, and now we're going back 150 years, in the whole infrastructural system, right? If you remember, uh, this, the, the urban um, condition was thought to be a space of circulation or a space that would uh, provide both full locomotion, full speed, full circulation and movement on the one hand, and the space of rest on the other one, right? These two um, uh, opposed um, uh, features of of modern life, of modern civilization, right? And extreme care was put in, in the designing of the infrastructures as, as, uh, uh, in this kind of hygienic paradigm, a reformist, social reformist paradigm that Serda was part of, bringing uh, fresh water supply, water collector, sewage, uh, water sewage, and so on and so forth. So the, the, the space of the urban planner, where the urban planner puts all of his or her effort is in defining uh, this space in between buildings, this infrastructural space that would allow the city to grow and expand. And this we have seen if we now follow the evolution of the city, how essential to the implementation of this plan was, for instance, all of the underground sanitation plans and works done following uh, Serda's plan, for instance, the, this. Uh, um, uh, the plan developed by um, Pere Garcia Farias, engineering uh, engineer, that actually made possible the implementation of the expansion, and that it linked also going back to some of these questions regarding uh, the landscape or regarding the surrounding or the existing uh, elements in the landscape. Uh, the sanitation plan was expanded into a territorial system or territorial. Uh, uh, almost regional space where irrigation uh, uh, cultivation spaces are uh, somehow integrated into a into a planning of uh, or into this um, uh, dual relations between city and region or or um, hinterland in a way. An example of how essential it becomes or uh, this shift from uh, the, the, the city building as a, as a monumental space, as a space defined by the character of its architecture to a model that puts the focus and the emphasis in the infrastructure, uh, in the system that would allow the city to emerge. And how important it is for Sada, if you remember the five bases that underpin his theory of organization, at the breaking down of urban development in, in different levels, the administrative levels, the, the, the economic level, the, um, the technical level, and so on and so forth. So the understanding that the city grows at different speeds 
and according to different actors. Um, so my purpose, quoting Sardar, my pur purpose was not to express the materiality of the city, but rather the manner and system that these groups follow in forming, so the groups of the, the settlements, the, the city formations, and how all the elements that constitute them are organized and function. That is to say that in addition to the materiality, I needed to express the organism, the life, if I may call it such, which animates the material part, right? So what's the, the, the organism that really uh, brings life to the city? Uh, example of the extreme rigorous uh, statistics that they've compiled in order to create the empirical basis for the, for the planning decisions. And then very quickly, also some of the questions came uh, uh, last year of how it eventually took shape. I'm going to flip very quickly through a series of, we still have, how much time do we have left? We have finished actually, but okay. carry on. Finished. Let's stop if someone needs to leave, no problem with that. All right, so then I would, because I, I think it's interesting to very, very quickly, I just make this connection um, to, I would flip over this, but showing just the, the evolution of the city and how the system had really uh, gone through different uh, administrative uh, norms in terms of ordinances and so on that differ from the original plan, but still the character of the city, if we look at it from Ross's idea of a primary element really still defines the character of the city. But I was interested in just finishing here, a project that the Curvisier together with CERT uh, developed for Barcelona, and that in a way bring together all of these different schools and trends we've been looking at. On the one hand, uh, it was a, a project of expansion of the project of expansion that survived it, right? and really applying the, the modernistic principles in the city of Barcelona. So we can see overlapping here, or juxtapose here, all of these different models, the old at the center, the old dense um, medieval fabric, then Serdas first expansion in the city block, um, and then uh, a super block that was proposed by Le Corbusier and Serp, which was um, formed by adding three by three urban blocks or urban units by Serda, right? So in this way, scaling up uh, uh, and, and I guess for the first time using the notion of super block um, and then liberating uh, all of this space in between uh, roads for, for open space, green space, leisure, recreational space. So it's very much the implementation of, of, of the logics or principles we've, been, we've seen earlier. So from this model to this model uh, that we just saw by Kriya, how um, post, the postmodern approach to urban design, we could say urban planning has is, is been a, uh, a retreat, um, um, yeah, a retreat in terms of all of its ambitions, not only in terms of scale, but also as a political, social, and transformative ambition or scope that urbanism has. Um, yeah, I thought that this super block thing would be interesting if we look at contemporary Barcelona today. Now I'm really going over this because it's now picked again and, and the current transformation of the city now builds on the idea of the super block from a more ecological sustainable perspective right introducing this green access that somehow remind of of the initial uh, plans by a certain like we said uh, okay that would be that would be all i guess thank you very much it has been a interesting journey these two last lectures i i hope our lectures have given the students certain, I wouldn't say <laughs> a knowledge or, or, or even a comprehensive study of urban history, because it can be hundreds of, of, of hours. But I hope it has given a kind of roadmap or a spine, if we are more anthropomorphic, to add your own readings so that there is a kind of 
you sort of know what has happened. You know some details of it. And now you can add your own reading to it, which, which then I hope will give you a, a comprehensive knowledge. And I remind that, uh, that the books by Spiro Kostov, they, they are these two about the city, which we've discussed, are really important to read. And we agree that they will be read by uh, Yanibav. Uh, need some day.